Hello and welcome. This is your weekly Bible study from the Church of the Nazarene. This Bible study comes from the publication titled Faith Connection, which is published by the Church of the Nazarene through its publishing companies, the Foundry Publishing Company, and is presented to you by the Green Bar Valley Church of the Nazarene. Today we are looking at session two in the unit called Beginnings, a look at the book of Genesis. And today we will be reading from Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 19. But before we read the word of the Lord, let's have a conversation with our Lord. Heavenly Father, this is being recorded on September the 11th. This is the 20th anniversary of what we all who were there remember. Lord, we just ask that as a great example of this fallen world, we just ask your continued presence in our lives because it is through you, God, that is the only way that we will make it through. You are our hope. You are our strong rock. You are our guide. You are our help. You are everything, Lord. And we thank you so much that you do love us enough to walk with us through everything we face in this life. And Lord, as your word says, you go before us, you go beside us, and you go behind us. We are encompassed in your loving arms each and every moment of each and every day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And we love you because you first loved us. And it's in the great name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We, as I said earlier, we are reading Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. And the internal title is called The Fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals this, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the certain serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enemy between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. 
With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. And this is the word of the Lord. The title of the lesson today is After the Beginning, Grace. And we have to remember that God brings us grace in the midst of sin and offers us victory for life. And we have to be receptive to God's grace and to extend it or offer that grace to others. Now, we saw last week that God created everything in order, with order, for order, on purpose, and with purpose. This week, we'll see that God offers grace and redemption in the time of sin. We are constantly bombarded with news about wars, crimes, and various immoral escapades. This raises a theological question. If God pronounced the world good when he created it, why is the world such a mess? And of course, we just read the answer to that, sin. So let's take a look at the passages we just read. Let's look at, at verses 1 through 7. Human will misused. The opening text highlights the conversation between the serpent and Eve. The serpent's first line of deception with Eve greatly exaggerated God's prohibitive command and caused his motives into doing so into question. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, God commanded the couple to refrain from the fruit of only one garden tree. The serpent, on the other hand, extended the prohibition to the fruit of every tree in the garden. Eve's response indicated that she completely understood God's direction about the garden fruit, which were permitted for enjoyment and which one fruit was off limits. In verse 3, Eve misquotes God's directive just as the serpent had done. She added a prohibition against touching the fruit an action which God had not required. This expansion of God's directive made God's motives seem unrealistic, just as the serpent had done. Eve then presented God's instructions negatively rather than positively. She could have argued that God's directions promoted life. Instead, she emphasized death as the consequences of disobedience. What God intended for the couple's good, she interpreted as a threat. The serpent cleverly called God's definition of truth into question and redefined truth in a way that seemingly benefited the couple. The serpent's redefinition of truth allowed the woman to satisfy her physical and intellectual hunger. The man followed suit. Immediately, the couple realized they had traded God's truth for a lie and earned far more consequences for their actions than they ever imagined. Now, let's take a look at verses 8 through 13. Let's call them the blame game. God's probing question in verse 9 does not imply ignorance. Rather, God politely invited them to join him without accosting them about their disobedience. He called to them not from a spirit of anger and judgment, but from a heart filled with disappointment and, dis and parental pain. God could have immediately pronounced judgment up on the failed couple, but he didn't. He chose a series of probing questions to help his children come to terms with what they had done. 
More than that, he immediately went into action to reestablish their broken relationship. Adam and Eve defaulted to a reasoning strategy that people have frequently employed, the blame game. Adam first blamed God for bringing Eve into his life. Then he reasoned that God should, should judge Eve, not him. Eve quickly passed blame off onto the serpent for deceiving her. As the couple analyzed the situation, God could not hold either one of them responsible, should not hold either one of them responsible for their actions. God himself and the serpent should assume blame. And now let's look at the last five verses we read, 14 through 19. Consequences for their actions. God responded to Adam, Eve, and the serpent by first addressing the serpent. God immediately pronounced a curse upon him. However, verse 15 gives us a glimpse into the compassionate heart of our loving Heavenly Father as he announced his plan to redeem his children from the spiritual mess they have created. This verse is recognized by most Bob. Bible scholars as the first reference to the good news of our redemption made possible through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The serpent deceived humanity through temptation, which led to sin and alienation from God. God would respond by sending his son to earth to break the power of temptation and sin and restore right relationship with the Father. We must pay careful attention to the remaining verses of this passage. While God pronounced a curse upon the serpent, he did not, did not curse Adam and Eve. Rather, he announced some of the many consequences they would encounter as a result of their disobedience. The pain connected to Eve's childbearing encompasses the physical anguish in the birth process, but also includes the emotional stress a mother often experiences in raising her children to adulthood. God announced that Adam would no longer be in harmonious relationship with the ground. Anguishing toil would characterize Adam's life as he worked the soil for food in order to feed his family. Finally, God said life outside the garden would result in return to the dust from which they came. As in, as in all compromise with sin, nothing turned out for Adam and Eve as they envisioned the day they yielded to temptation and disobeyed the Father. It never does. Here's something to think about. The word sin and Satan do not appear in Genesis chapter 3. However, the suggestive influence of Satan characterizes the conversation and suggestions offered by the serpent. The re result of the first couple's choice describe the consequences of sin. Now also think about this. Once we become recipients of God's grace, we have the privilege of offering that grace to others. Our reconciliation with God opens a way for us to announce the possibility for others to experience that same reconciliation. You know, it's ironic that people today fail, just as the first couple failed, to recognize the fruit, even the most beautiful and succulent fruit, has a limited lifespan and soon spoils. Now, John Wesley one of the founders of our theological tradition spoke of sins properly and improperly. So-called. A sin that is properly so-called is a willful transaction 
or transgression against a known law of God. These sins are open, knowing acts of rebellion against God. These sins break our relationship with God and place our lives in serious, eternal danger. Remember, because of the fall, humankind has a potency to sin. But through Jesus Christ, we can overcome that. And we can, once again, establish a right, loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even though we have been flawed, we have transgressed against you, we have been wrong. You are there with your arms wide open saying, come to me. I love you. I will always love you. Accept my grace. Lord, it is up to us to accept your grace or not. But Lord, we thank you and we love you for providing it for us and providing the final solution, your son Jesus, who lived, died, and lived again, that we may overcome sin and overcome death and have eternal life with you. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed day.